What's up, everybody? Rage Kid 20 here. Back with another Mr. Ballin' story. Today we have Teen Find Secret Room on College Campus. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, now, I don't know what the story's gonna be about, but when I saw that title, it made me think of a secret room underneath College Campus that I went to. Um, now, this was like a fallout shelter because, you know, old campuses. Back in the time where we were afraid of nuclear warfare and stuff like that, back during the Cold War and, you know, those times. Uh, they had these, like, fallout shelters and stuff because apparently uh, they did not be believe that radiation could travel downstairs. So if, if, as long as it was underneath the base level, you were fine. I don't think they really thought that one through. I don't think it would have worked very well, but... Money got to. Uh, but uh, I always noticed in the music department there was this big old double door that never was never used for anything, for any reason. And uh, I found out later that it actually connected there to the building right next to us because when I took a history class, we actually went down, they brought us down into there... I don't remember why, because uh, I don't even think it was about that period of his U.S. history. <laughs> I think it was just history. Uh, and we actually went down and went into the room where they had all the old, like, rations and stuff that, you know, like, never go bad kind of stuff. Uh, and it was very creepy. The thought of, it almost looked like some kind of, like, boiler room and, like, some kind of uh, mixed with, like, a storeroom and whatnot. But it really, it would have been really... Um, you would have gone crazy fast if you had to stay down there for a long period of time with a bunch of different individuals. Uh, but then I found out that that was connected to that room, to, to the uh, to the music building. And I don't know uh, if that's going to have anything to do with that. Who knows what's in this secret room on this college campus. But it sounds exciting and interesting. And um, I... Uh, I got, I got, just, I got to throw something out here real fast. Sorry for a longer than usual intro, but um, I don't know what happened, y'all. I don't know what happened. Like the first Mr. B video got around 50, 60 ish views, respectable for my channel. You know, what I, mean? I don't get a lot, so that's a good amount. Uh, one like, one dislike, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, very cool. So I was like, you know, and I released the second one like I was going to because, you know, that one might get more attention. That one got around 80 views. Like two likes, I think. Two or three likes, you know. Cool. Pretty good. The third one I released about the dude ruining six lives in six seconds. Started out day one. Pretty usual. Like day two and three, I swear every hour that I refreshed it had another hundred views. <laughs> and I was just like, what until it got to 888 and then just stopped for a while which i think someone intended and planned tons of thumbs up tons of thumbs down <laughs> it just blew the fuck up out of nowhere and the other ones haven't it's, the one afterwards also didn't get that many it still got around 50 to 80 you know for usual zone or around 100 i think maybe but like what the fuck? It's so weird how people will find one of them and just like it blows up, and then they don't go look at the other ones you have on your channel. I don't, I don't understand that necessarily, but um, <laughs> but I mean, like, thank you. Like that one's closing in on a thousand views, which is not a lot, but for me, that's a lot. Uh, the only ones that ever got up to a thousand views is like Nightwish and or Ginger. Uh, the only ones that get close to that. So like Jesus. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but I also thought it was absolutely hilarious that there was a person on there. I don't know if it was the per the owner who made these videos like came at me in the comments saying that I had a fake trying voice. Whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> and it was very cringe. You can go see the comment on there. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> I just, it was just like, like, I'm sorry, did I hurt you in some way, shape, or form? Like, I don't have any, like, hey guys, I'm trying, I'm putting on a face. Like, I'm sorry you hate the tone, the natural 
my natural voice. That sucks to be you, but it's kind of really insulting. Uh, kind of a dickish thing to say. And then I went and watched their video. There are very few videos that they've done uh, about horses and stuff. And in the comments, they're saying like, hey, you know, make sure you don't give poor advice if you don't know what you're talking about. Like that was a constant theme that they were they were giving people. And I, and I so very much wanted to be like, yeah, maybe you should follow your own advice, shouldn't you? I so wanted to comment on that video. But I was like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I was like, maybe someone should take their own advice and just leave that comment in there. I so want to really badly, but you know, it's just funny how someone could be like, hey, let's be positive, guys, and then go tax some stranger that they don't even fucking know. It's just, it's good shit. Anyways, that's not what we're here for today. I just thought that was a, 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 a fascinating, like, holy shit, this random Mr. Ballin story out of all the other ones just blew up for some fucking reason, and the other ones didn't. Plus, that comment on it, I just thought it was fucking hilarious. So. <laughs> so but you won't see this one for much much longer because uh, i've recorded so many of these uh, between those so these are usually long and i've already been talking for six minutes so i don't know what kind of secret room this person found but uh 40 minutes i can only imagine this is gonna be one hell of a story so let's get to it today we're gonna look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways but be Oh, interesting. So it's going to be three different stories. That makes sense. And uh, he has that title. But I guess at this point he decided he was at part double digits. So he decided, fuck it. We'll just, I'm not going to title that anymore. I don't know. But hey, I like those kind of stories. Let's go. Before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do. And we upload no, once or twice every week. So, if that's of interest to you, please gently pull up behind the like button at a red light, and okay. the instant it turns green, immediately lay on your horn to speed the like button up. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. I like multiple stories, baby. Let's go. At 7.20 p.m. on Friday, January 12, 2007, 19-year-old college freshman Wade Steffi walked into Ford Dining Hall, which is one of five dining halls on Purdue University's campus. So that's a lot of fucking dining halls. <laughs> How big is that fucking campus? I can see maybe two or three, but five? Jeez, oh, that pays for two. Anyways, um, yeah, boiler room, you know, is starting to follow that. You know what I said? Yeah, hey, hey. I want to Purdue is a prestigious American university located Apparently. in Indiana that is known for its excellent athletics and academics. Wade, who was an aviation technology student and Damn. was at Purdue on a full academic scholarship, grabbed some food Legit. and then sat down at a table with some friends. This was the first Friday of the 2007 spring semester, and so Wade and his friends at the table and the hundreds of other students that were sitting all around them were buzzing with excitement about what they were up to that night and what they were up to that weekend. And so Wade and his friends, they... That's a nice fucking dining hall, dog. God damn. Fuck going on here? I wonder how expensive that college is sat there chatting about their plans for about an hour and then at around 8 20 p.m wade realized he needed to leave and so he stood up he said goodbye to his friends he carried his tray to the trash can and then he made his way out of the doors he came in on and so once he was outside of the dining hall he immediately turned right and walked the very short distance to the building that was right next to ford dining hall and so that building was called Owen Hall, and it was a dormitory. Now, this was not Wade's dormitory. He actually lived in a different dorm called Kerry Quad West, which was located on the other side of Ford Dining Hall. And so Wade goes inside of Owen Hall because he has some friends in there, and he makes his way to their room. Uh, I was hoping there's somebody had a girl up in there, and I'm like, Wade, you dirty dog. See what you do. Get some of that. Like, no. Anyways. <sighs> And when he goes inside, he sees they're all kind of sitting around chatting and drinking some alcoholic drinks. And so Wade sits down and he has a couple of drinks and he Bruh. just hangs out with his friends for about an hour. Now, I know this happens at college all the time. I had a drunken pirate offer me weed once. I was like, no, I'm good, man. Um, but like, bro, 
I know, like, in a lot of places, it's, like, stupid, like, 21's the drinking age, but, like, 21, here is the drinking age, you all getting smashed at 19, come on, bruh, come on, y'all, be, be responsible, man, alcohol's not that great, you can wait, oh, that rhymed, though. Hour. And so around 9.30 p.m., Wade and the other people he was with in this room, they left Owen Hall and they walked the half mile away from campus to the west to this huge party at a fraternity. And oh, so good. Wade would stay at this fraternity for several hours until about midnight, at which point he pulled one of his friends aside and he told them that he just remembered he had left his jacket inside of Owen Hall okay. and so he wanted to go back and retrieve it. The dorms on Purdue's campus all lock at night and so the only way you can get inside is if you live there and so you have a key or if you know someone who lives there who will open the door for you and so during his walk back to owen hall wade would make six phone calls in an attempt to get someone in owen hall to open the door for him but four of his phone calls would just be the wrong number and so the people that were picking up and he was asking to open the door they didn't know what he was talking about and so they hung up <laughs> So dude, uh, dude, uh, oh, uh, warmed up. What do they call that? There's a term for it. Uh, uh, is it a warm up? I don't know. So he got, he, he had some of that free liquor before he went to the party. So he was already, you know, he was uh, already getting some. And then he probably got fucking just sloshed up at that party. Now he's drunkenly trying to get his fucking coat. I mean... You gotta be more responsible than that. It doesn't sound like anyone coming with him and helping him out. Like, this is, you know, one of the many pitfalls of alcohol. It sounds like a good time. But then you wander around alone, calling people, be like, yo, open your door. And they're just like, who, what? No. <laughs> who are you? So, like, you know, if you gotta get fucking hammered, you have to have a designated buddy around to make sure that you don't fucking die. It's just common sense people come on now but he did call two people that did live inside of Owen Hall. However, they didn't answer their phones. And so around 12.30 a.m., Wade arrived at Owen Hall. He put his phone back in his pocket and he just walked up to the doors, which were locked, and he just started knocking. And eventually, a resident of Owen Hall who didn't know Wade and Wade didn't know them, they heard the knocking and they came out to the door to see what was going on. And they looked through the glass and they saw Wade and apparently they decided that Wade looked looked too intoxicated yeah. to let into the building yeah. and so they refused him entry and so Wade apparently stood there he kept knocking for a little bit but he eventually just kind of gave up he turned around and he walked away fast I mean good yeah like if I was someone was knocking just like hey let me in I'd be like nah <laughs> just go back to my room <laughs> nah man like, if there's a chance that you're in here trying to find somebody who doesn't want to see you, you're drunk, you're going to start beating them up or something like that. I'm not taking that chance, man. It's just, yeah, it's not a good look, man. You're too drunk. You need help. Forward a few days to Tuesday, January 16th, and That's Wade's insane, roommate, right? who had actually been gone all the past weekend, he returned, and the first thing he noticed when he got back to his dorm was that Wade was not in the dorm. And so he called and texted Wade, but he didn't get a response. And so the roommate went out around the floor that they lived on to ask people if they had seen Wade, and no one had seen him since the previous Friday. And so starting to get pretty concerned, the roommate called Wade's family to see if maybe they knew what was going on with him but his family had no idea. And so by the end of that day, the police had been contacted about Wade potentially being missing, and they in turn contacted Wade's cell phone provider, and they were able to determine that Wade's cell phone was still showing up somewhere on Purdue's campus, although they couldn't figure out exactly where. So that evening, a ma- Which is, uh, I mean, first off, it could be because there's a fucking flip phone. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, the maybe technology wasn't quite there. I think they said, what, 2007? So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but also, like, um, like, it could be because, you know, underground satellites. The reception to try to track where that phone is could just not be, you know, that great at that point. But I think it's, I mean, a little weird. Maybe if he was, like, trying all day kind of thing. But, like, you just show up and be like, oh, my roommate's not here. And you call him and just like, well, that's weird. He's not answering his phone. 
Like, even if it's like, yeah, usually the answer is his phone or whatnot, he could just be somewhere on the campus, not able to answer his phone at the time. A little, it seems a little weird to panic and be like, I gotta call his parents, like, someone's not right here. Has anyone seen him? No one's seen him? You know? It's like, maybe everyone, everyone wasn't paying attention to the whereabouts of your roommate, you know? It's like, you know, I don't think it's really necessarily reason to worry but if he doesn't show up by the next day and you still can't get a hold of him then i'd say like okay yeah you know massive campus-wide search was launched with hundreds <laughs> yo this person just gazing down that fucking camera hundreds of police officers and volunteers even the school's equestrian club came out with their horses to search the nearby woods but they have an equestrian club they have people that just ride horses for a club on campus. This campus is wild, man. Despite this huge search effort that would go on for several weeks, the oh, only shit. thing they would find of Wade's was one of his shoes. It was found on January 20th, so just four days into the search, and it was located right outside of an exterior door that led into a maintenance room inside of Owen Hall. But when they searched this maintenance room, Wade wasn't Owen? in there. Finally, after nearly a month of searching, when they still had not found Wade, the official search was called off. On March 19th, roughly two months after Wade had been reported missing, a maintenance worker was downstairs in the laundry room of Owen Hall when they heard a strange popping sound. Oh. At first, the worker oh, thought it was actually coming from one of the washers or dryers that was on, and you know, maybe there's a loose coin or some piece of metal that was inside of the washer or dryer that's getting banged around inside, and that's making the sound. And so this worker began walking around the laundry room, kind of listening listening in to each of the washers and dryers that were on to see if they were making this sound. And so as he's doing this, he hears the popping sound again, but it's clearly not coming from any of the washers and dryers. In fact, it's not even coming from inside the laundry room. It's coming from somewhere out in the hall. Curious, he leaves the laundry room and he goes out into the hall. And as soon as he's standing in the hall, he hears the popping sound again. And this time it was obvious that it was coming from behind the closed door that was directly opposite the laundry room. So the worker pulled out his big set of keys, he opened the door that was directly in front of him, and he stepped inside. Moments later, he would make a big discovery. Based on that discovery and the investigation that would follow it, this is a reconstruction of what happened to Wade Steffi. In the early morning hours of January 13th, right after Wade had been denied entry into Owen Hall because the student who was in there who didn't know him thought he was too intoxicated, right after that happened, Wade left the front doors and made his way around to the left side of the building to look back. for another way inside. And when he got to the left side of the building, he found another door. Now, even though this door did not have a sign on it that said, keep out, it was fairly obvious that this door was not designed for students to use. There was a metal railing that <laughs> lined <laughs> the outside of this door, clearly to prevent pedestrians from getting to the door, and the door itself was actually not built at ground level. It right. basically was built at basement level. Right. So you'd be standing at this railing looking down at the door. And down in front of the door was a slab of cement right out in front of it that gave the door enough clearance to be able to open. And so basically there was a railing around a pit and that was where the door was. Right. The proper way to get to this door was to literally climb over that railing and jump down into this pit. And then you'd need a key to open the store because it was always locked. Right. Well, it was supposed to always be locked. And so when Wade saw this clearly off limits door on the side of Owen Hall, in his drunken state, he decided it would be a good idea to try to go into it because in his mind, he thought, you know, whatever is behind the store doesn't really matter. As long as I can just get inside of some part of Owen Hall, I can find my way up to my friend's room and I can get my jacket. Something's telling me it matters, buddy. Um, so, I mean, I don't know where the story is going to go, what's going to be the conclusion of the story, but like, you had that many people on a search and not a single one of them was like, hey, just on the wild off chance, how about all the doors that should be impossible to get into on this campus? Maybe we will unlock them and we try them. Not a single person had that realization. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a, co a campus that clearly allows alcohol uh, <laughs> or at least 
people are drinking alcohol, there is a frat house right nearby. Like, none of them? Stuff for a second that said maybe he drunkenly stumbled into a place that he shouldn't have gone. Somewhere he should, probably should not have been able to get into, but hey, shit happens. Not a single one of them was like, let's try out the, out of the other doors. I mean, maybe they did, and he was just like passed out in a corner or something, and like no one found him, and they were like, oh, no one in here or something. Like, maybe, but like, so far from what it's leading up here, it's like, no one, no one thought about that. Okay, all right, then. And so he rushes over to the railing, he climbs over, he leaps down into that pit area, he grabs the doorknob of this off-limits door, and he pulls on it, and it's open. So he opens it up, he steps inside, and it's totally pitch black. And all he can hear is the sound of machines humming and whirring in the darkness. And again, in his drunken state, he decides this is still a good idea. His only concern was he couldn't find a light switch and it really was basically pitch black in here. And he was worried once the door shut, not only would his only light source be totally cut off, but it might actually lock behind him yeah. and then he'd be trapped inside of this thing. room. And so he took off one of his shoes and he tucked it in the door jam of the door he came in on to keep it open. And so with the door propped open behind him, he began walking into this room and pretty much. So if they found his shoe and they found it outside of Owen or inside of Owen, they, I, my, my wildest thoughts is they must have searched the area. So I'm wondering how they didn't find him. Because there's no way you'd find a shoe there and you don't search the place top to bottom. So I wonder what happened and how they didn't discover him in there. Much right away, he bumped into this big metal structure. He couldn't see what it was because, again, it was too dark. But he could feel it and he could tell, you know, it was a flat metal structure. It felt like a machine of some kind. And he could hear that it was one of the machines that was buzzing and whirring. And so he just decided he would try to walk around it. Because again, his goal is just to get through this room and find another door somewhere and kind of continue his journey up into the dorm. And so Wade began moving his way left along this machine, kind of believing it was gonna come to a stop at some point, and then he could walk around it. But it would turn out this machine was very big, very wide. And so by the time he actually got to the left edge of this machine, he was practically right up against the wall of the room he was in. And when he got there, he realized the space between the side of the machine and the wall of the room stuck, was he? big enough oh, no. that if he turned sideways, no. he could basically squeeze his way past it. Now, he had no idea how far into the room this strange machine went, but in his drunken state, he decided it was a good idea. So, there's a few things to take away from here right now. Uh, one, be appreciative, be people for what you have. Back in the day, we didn't have uh, the power of the sun and flashlights in the palm of our hand at all times. So, uh, be thankful for your, your iPhones and your fancy, fancy phone machines that can light up an entire room. We didn't have that back in the day. We didn't have flashlight. It was like this. You fuck. Secondly, um, yeah, you know, just I just like to point out all the times when like drinking's really not that great, man. <laughs> when you're drunk, anything's a great idea, and drink your drink is just really not. It's not good for you, man. You really shouldn't do it. But if you are gonna be crazy and decide, yo, everyone gets fucked up, I want to drink. If you're gonna be one of them people, one of them many people, um. You gotta have someone watching out for you. Everyone can't be pissed drunk, you know, at the same place. You know what I'm saying? Like, someone has to be sober. And make sure there's someone sober there watching your back. Otherwise, you're gonna wake up in the boiler room and no one's gonna find you. Because it's doubtful that this dude survived two months alive, trapped in a, in a location like this. There's no way. He would die from starvation. But first, you die from dehydration. So, yeah, you double die. So, uh, yeah. Doubt he found anything to survive off of in there, even when it's over. Imagine how fucking confused you gotta be to wake up and that's where you at. He's just, like, stuck behind machinery. You're just like, where the fuck am I? How the fuck am I? Again, maybe you just shouldn't drink. I don't know. It's crazy thoughts. Yeah, interesting.
And so he turns sideways, so his back is to the wall of the room, and his chest is going to be facing the machine, and he begins pushing himself into that narrow space. And so as he's making his way, his hands are up, kind of protecting his face and neck, and at some point, he kind of begins to trip. Now, he didn't actually fall because he's basically wedged into this tight space. But for a second, he reflexively grabbed with his hands onto this machine right in front of him. And just by chance, his left ring finger slipped into a very narrow hole that was about two inches deep. The room that Wade was inside of was called an electrical vault, and it contained six large transformers, one of which Wade's finger had just stuck inside of. The job of these six trans... They're going to get a picture of the actual... They got the pictures of all the other devices. Transformers is to take the high voltage they receive from the main power grid and then transform it, hence the name, into lower usable voltage that gets dispersed into Owen Hall for residents and teachers. Even right. though the outside of these transformers had mostly been covered with protective materials that mitigated the electrocution risk, there were still several parts of these machines Not that the there was bag. just nothing you could do. They just presented a really high electrocution risk. And one of those sections you needed to be extra careful with was that two inch hole that Wade's finger slipped inside of. No At the way. back of that hole was an exposed electrical conductor. And the second the tip of his finger touched that Dead. conductor, it's between nice. 2,000 and 4,000 yeah. volts of electricity were pumped Nearly into dead. his body. For reference, when people get executed via the electric chair, they are electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Mm -hmm. Wade likely died instantly. In but, instantaneously. But because of the fact that he was kind of wedged between the transformer and the wall, after he died, he didn't just slump onto the ground. Instead, he remained in a semi-upright yeah. position with his finger still stuck inside of that hole. And so for the next two months, his body just continued Constantly to be electrocuted fried. every second. Finally, oh, his are burning. Finally, sometime in March, as a result of Wade's body fluids draining out of him, the electrical current that was being pumped into him altered its course and began snapping outside of his skin into the ground. And so the sound... That's so fucking fucked, dog. Uh. ...of the electrical current actually striking the ground was that popping sound that the maintenance worker heard. The door that the maintenance worker opened in order to investigate the sound was the only other door that led into the electrical vault, the other being the exterior door that Wade had gone in on. Initially, when the worker opened that door and looked inside of the vault, he actually didn't see Wade, yeah. but he smelled something funny, and that was... Decaying, burnt flesh. What led him to walk into the room and make his way around, and that's when he spotted Wade's body. Earlier on January 20th, when they found Wade's shoe, which at some point had just slipped out of the door jamb, so it was not propping open the exterior door when it was found, it was just sitting in that pit area, and the exterior door was shut. I assume they checked, but to find him? How would you not find him? Like, I know he's hidden behind everything, but like... It's, it's part of him had like electrocuted you're probably going to give off a kind of burnt human flesh smell aren't you if you're being constantly electrocuted for a week or so before they would have probably checked that area you would have to give off some kind of smell right who the fuck did not find it and so when they found that shoe the police they did go inside of the electrical vault but they didn't go in through the exterior door they went around and went in the same door that the maintenance worker opened from right across the hall from the laundry room. And when they opened it up, they just looked into the room. They didn't walk into the room, they just looked from the doorway, and from their perspective, they couldn't see Wade. And so that was why initially they had said, you know, Wade is not inside of that room. Ultimately, because that... I mean, he was still dead regardless. Like, he dead, died probably instantaneously like it's probably merely dead um so it's not like they would have been able to see him or anything but like police officers there's a reason why people don't trust you right especially right now why people don't like police officers like first off he's like oh his shoe outside of this door let's not go in this door <laughs> like no you 
be like, all right, get the maintenance person. We're going to get this door open. We're going to get in this door. Is this door unlocked? Like, you go in that door. But they at least went to that room. Who just peeks it open like, no, I don't see him. <laughs> like, those officers were fired, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> those officers were fired, right? Their policy on how to fucking search for a missing body was changed, right? Like, the fuck's wrong with you guys? That exterior door to the electrical vault was supposed to be locked at all times, and clearly it was not because that's how Wade got in. Purdue was found to be negligent, and so they agreed to pay Wade's family five. I mean, that's at least fair. 500000 I mean, yeah, that's at least fair. He's still not going to take back the, the pain or whatnot, but like. I mean, you know, yeah, five hundred thousand. I think I think is definitely fair because, like, I mean, dude was drunk. What was he doing? Walk around drunk, you know? what I mean, like, that's not really our place to have drunk safety precautions around. We don't give the alcohol to students, so like, I I could see that for sure. But like, uh, yeah, if there's places where you could die if you happen to stumble in drunk, it should always be locked. Like, it should be checked to make sure that it's always locked. So that that, that that's that's fair. Uh, that's, that's fair that they gave money and it's the word that's like sorry man shit happens yeah so that's good five hundred thousand dollars and they also set up a scholarship in wade's name legit before we get into our next story i want to tell you about today's sponsor yeah. better help when i first sought out therapy to try to deal with some of my mental health issues i remember feeling really nervous about that first interaction with the therapist but you i do honestly think that everyone should get therapy uh therapy is really good it's not something to do if you're crazy or have issues or anything like that honestly i think the whole world especially the u.s would be better with um if everyone was seeking counseling and whatnot there's a uh, life is hard and you need people to help you out so this is actually a very good sponsor to check into if you were having if you feel like you're having issues in your life so definitely something to check out there um definitely support that as Nothing was mentioned about the scops, though. The scops, the scops did a horrible fucking job. Um, anyways. Um, yeah, dude, that's fucking tragic, bro. Like, you just wanted to... St all that just because you wanted a sweatshirt? How, how bad do you got to be to be the friends? Just thinking, like, if I picked up that phone that night, D would be alive. <laughs> But you can't necessarily blame yourself, but, like, you know, because it's like, what was he doing drunk without any backup, you know? Just, again, probably shouldn't drink people. Anyways, next story. Something about Death you Valley or something? off starting therapy because maybe you are intimidated about starting the process. Then I would highly encourage you to make BetterHelp your starting point. And you get 10% off your first month if you go to BetterHelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. Okay, back to the stories. I feel like help is a much easier word to spell than better if we're going to be spelling one out. But hey, what? You know, whatever. Not health, help. Maybe that's what it was. Anyways, Death Valley sounds exciting. During the California gold rush of 1848, hundreds of thousands of Americans living on the east coast of the United States packed up their things in covered wagons and headed west for California to attempt to quite literally strike gold. About a year after the rush started, so in the winter of 1849, a group of about 100 would-be gold prospectors were on their way across the continental United States to California when they got lost in this totally barren stretch of desert, roughly 500 miles from their destination, which was San Francisco. They would spend the next two months driving around this desert looking for a way out, but they wouldn't find it. And so finally, they just stopped, set up camp, and waited to die. But as a last-ditch effort, they sent ahead two of their fittest men to try to go out and find help. And miraculously, those two men would find help, and it wasn't long before the lost pioneers were going up and over this mountain pass out of the desert out to safety. 
And so as the pioneers are cresting this mountain, one of the pioneers turns and looks down at the desert valley below where they almost all died. And he famously said, goodbye, Death Valley, and the name stuck. While Death Valley has yeah. since become a very popular tourist destination for adventurous people, it is still truly one of the harshest environments on the planet. In addition to just being a big open desert, which presents a whole host of problems to any mammal, Death Valley also becomes one of the hottest places on the planet every summer. The temperatures soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit and sometimes get as high as 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the kind of place where if you don't respect it, it will kill you. In 2005, a 35-year-old man named Robert Darmer, who lived in Los Angeles, California, decided he wanted to take a trip into Death Valley. Yeah. Specifically, he Why wanted not? to go to the hot springs located in the northwest corner of Death Valley. Oh, yeah, and actually, there's a nudist resort that is right around those <laughs> hot springs. And so Robert... <laughs> Oh, Robert. Hey, Robert. I see what you're trying to do. Okay. First, it seemed a little crazy and potentially stupid. But I thought he was just like, I want to see if I can survive it. Let me try to trek the whole thing or something. But if you're just trying to go to the hospital specifically, that actually sounds like a kind of a cool idea. Um, and I see <laughs> nudist Valley. I see what you're trying to do, Robert. You want to? Okay. Okay wanted to go check that whole scene out. Oh, and course. so on July 26th Robert, of that year, Robert left Los Angeles in his Volkswagen van, and he drove north about four hours until he got to Bishop, California, which is a small town where some of his family lived. After spending the night with them, the next morning when Robert got up, he got back into his van and he drove south about 20 minutes to a town called Zurich, California, where he picked up Death Valley Road. This road covers the entirety of Death Valley, starting from its northern entrance, where Robert was, all the way south, 140 miles to its southern entrance. And this road is actually basically a straight line. But yeah. off of this very straight road are literally hundreds of miles of unpaved roads that splinter off in all directions across the desert. And these roads bring people to other points of interest, like, for example, the nudist resort that Robert wanted to go to. So after Robert hopped onto the Death Valley Road at its northern entrance, he began driving south for about an hour, and then he began looking for the turnoff to the unpaved road that would take him the last 50 miles to the nudist resort. And so eventually, Robert believes he's found this turnoff Robert. and so he gets onto this unpaved road and he starts driving for a while and then all of a sudden his car just sinks down into the ground and it won't budge it would turn out robert had made a mistake he had not turned onto the correct unpaved road instead he had picked a road that led right out onto this salt flat and so to the naked mm -hmm. eye it would have looked like the ground in front of him was totally flat and hard packed and you could easily walk on or drive on it but in reality, the surface of the salt flat is very brittle. And underneath that brittle surface is this thick section of mud. And so before Robert could realize his mistake, he had broken through the surface layer of the salt flat and got stuck in that mud. After trying unsuccessfully to get his van back out again, Robert realized he was in a really bad situation. His cell phone had no reception, so he couldn't contact anyone, and he was too far away to attempt to walk to the nearest civilization to try to get help. But luckily, he had packed lots and lots of water that was in his van, Smart. and so he decided the only thing he could do was just sit tight at his van, ration out his water, and wait for someone on Death Valley Road to look out and see him and come to his rescue. But after waiting for six days, no one saw him. And now his water supply was dwindling, and so Robert decided his only option was to abandon his van and make the walk to civilization. Ooh. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I felt bad because home dude just wanted to see some naked people and potentially might end up dying for it. Or maybe he gets out alive. Um, <clears throat> but just, dude just wanted to peek and uh, <laughs> he got way more than he asked for. Now, nothing stupid about this one. I mean, it, it's a gamble either way. You 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 roll in the dice, fifty fifty shot. Someone finds you. Might not be perfectly fifty fifty, but you're taking the fifty fifty chance of someone either finds you, or you try to hoof it. Both could lead in absolute failure and death. It's a bad odds, 
whatever way you slice it. The problem is, he rolled the dice, and uh, it didn't come out in his favor, so now he's fucked. Because he, the 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 fifty fifty was odds were more in his favor when he had his full supply of water. Now now it's looking much much lower ten ten or under percent chance <laughs> of this going well from the initial fifty fifty because he's now has to make this trek with greatly reduced supply of water. So unless he finds water out there somewhere in the desert, he's fucking dead. So um he rolled the dice and the odds were not in his favor. And so now I don't know how he gets out of this one alive. He 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 gets sent to hell Mary miracle out of nowhere is the only way this dude survives this one. He's got to get found by somebody, find a water source somewhere in the desert. And or get out quickly. Otherwise, dude's dead. And so he packed up all the water he could. He threw it on his back and he began to walk. And just like the lost pioneers of 1849, at the very last second, Robert was rescued. As he stumbled across the desert, his canteen empty, this group of teenage boys and a few adults who were part of this group called the League of Venturers were out in Death Valley doing search and rescue training. And so they literally turned on... Practice. (laughs) They got some real practice up in here. Yeah, dude, as I said, some kind of Hail Mary super lucky miracle. You got lucky that people just so happened to be there at that time. Otherwise, you were dead. You a hundred percent, million percent fucking dead. To the same road that Robert accidentally turned onto and then got stuck on. And so they came down and found Robert. And Robert, when he saw them, he was hysterical. He was yeah. crying tears of joy. He knew he, he was really dead. believed he was going to die probably that day. Yeah. And so the League of Venturers, they take Robert into their van and they drive him 80 miles to the nearest ranger station. And as soon as Robert got out of the car, he dropped to his knees and he kissed the ground in appreciation. I mean, this guy really was that close to death. That- yeah, no. Dude knew, like, yeah, I know I'm dead. Like, unless something crazy happens, I'm dead. Like, there's, there's no way out of this. Uh, I rolled the 50-50, and it I, it came up uh, odds not in my favor. So uh, now I'm just, I'm doomed. <laughs> like, I'm absolutely fucked now. Dude got so fucking lucky. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. That evening, Robert would hitch a ride from the ranger station back to Bishop, California. And the next morning, Robert spoke with a local towing company, and they agreed to drive him out into Death Valley to locate his van and tow it back out again. But when they got out there and they found his van, the towing company saw that the van was not in good shape. It had two flat tires, and there were several other mechanical issues with it. And they told Robert, look, we can't tow it out until the repairs are made, and we can't make those repairs right now. And so they left the van where it was, and they drove Robert back to Bishop. And then when they got there, Robert, who was quite handy with his van, decided he would just make the repairs himself. And so he went around town. Duh. You, you you fucked with uh, Destiny once, and you're going to just try to, oh, maybe I get out this time? Bro, no, you leave that. That van's dead, dog. I don't know how much sentimental value that van's got to you, but that van's dead. I imagine the tires probably popped just from the heat in general, uh, being out in that heat for that long. I would imagine, but, I mean, maybe not even pop, but just flatten in general. That's crazy. Um... This dude survived death, and he's like, yo, let me go back out, man. I'm just sad. The dude didn't even get to see none. Like, dude, dude wanted to see some, some, whatever he's into, whatever giblets he's into. He didn't even get to see none. And now he's got to fix his van in the middle of death. Like, dude just digging his own grave deeper. All just to see Sapunani, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. He gathered up all the supplies he would need, and then that evening, he got a local young couple to give him a ride back into Death Valley. Robert had told his family right before he left that his plan was to go and fix his van, and then that night come back to Bishop, and then the next day, he would contact the towing company again, and they could come out and they could get his van out. 
But that night, Robert did not come back to Bishop, and the next morning, when his family still had not heard from him or seen him, they contacted authorities. It would take a few days, but the authorities would eventually figure out what happened to Robert. The young couple that gave Robert a ride back into Death Valley, they dropped him off at this intersection right off of Death Valley Road, where they and Robert believed was only about a mile away from that nudist resort that Robert had originally wanted to go to. Robert had told the couple that his plan was just to walk from that point. He would go to that resort and he would recruit somebody else to drive him the rest of the way to the van. He could make the repairs and that person would drive him back and that would be it. So Robert got out. He said thank you to the couple and he waved to them as they drove off. And then he stashed his van supplies and then turned away from Death Valley Road and began walking along this unpaved road into the desert. However, unbeknownst to Robert or to the couple, the spot he was dropped off was the wrong spot. He was not a mile or less away from this resort. He was about 15 miles away from this resort. Dude fucked up twice. If you didn't get the the, play, the location correctly the first time, you didn't get you didn't get it the first time. You thought like second time is the charm. Don't even bring me to it. Just drop me off close. We won't even check together. Now this dude is dumb. Now this guy's a dumb motherfucker. He's probably a dead motherfucker, but he's a dumb motherfucker. Dude just wants to see something that bad. <laughs> and I'll find it a mile. I walked worse than that. I'll find it. Yeah, it's just a mile, right? It's just a mile through death. Death can't play a trick on me twice. Death don't work like that. You survive it once, you're good. Have you ever seen Final Destination? You're good. It never comes back for you. You cheat death. Death doesn't have a vendetta at any point. It's not how it works, man. We're good. Drive off. I got this. I didn't... I didn't <laughs> flip death off in the face the first time for nothing, right? You dumb motherfucker. Now you got my official stamp. Dumb motherfucker. There you go. We got one this episode. There you go. Take it. It's yours. You earned it, buddy. Fucking Robert. And the path was fairly circuitous, so even if he knew the distance, he likely would not have been able to even navigate his way there. And so after wandering down this unpaved road for about 10 miles, Robert left the unpaved road and began heading out into open desert, likely seeking water. Robert would eventually collapse and die just four days after he had been rescued from the exact same situation. When his body was found, he didn't have a GPS or a map or even a container for water. <laughs> Dumb motherfucker, man. You don't risk that in death, bro. You don't risk that out in death. You, how, what the fuck? Fuck, how do you survive once just to do something so fucking stupid? Drive, the, have them drive you to the location. If you don't find it, be like, never mind, drive me out of here. Not taking death twice, you dumb motherfucker. In late 2002, 25-year-old Jason Chase worked as a sheep shearer in an area called Gisborne, which is located in the northeastern section of New Zealand. When Jason wasn't working, he was often on his bike, cycling up and down the coast, preparing for his next road race. In early December of that year, Jason contacted his family, who lived in a small town called Danaverk, which is located about 200 miles southwest of Gisborne, and he told them that he wanted to come visit them for Christmas. However, he didn't know exactly when he would actually arrive at their house, because his training and work schedule were fairly hectic, but he told them, don't worry, I will be there at least on Christmas day December 25th or a couple of days earlier his family was thrilled and they said no problem we can't wait to see you whenever that is and so by the time mid-December rolled around and Jason still had not arrived at his family's home in Danaverk his family wasn't concerned at all however that would soon change on December 13th a hunter was driving along the many winding back roads of the Ruahin mountain range this mountain range which is located about eight miles north of Danaverk is a very isolated and rugged wilderness area that's full of steep gorges 
bushes and gullies and very thick brush. And so as this hunter rounds the turn on this road, he looks up ahead and he sees there's a car parked on the side of the road. And so this hunter pulls up right alongside this car and he looks over and he can tell, you know, there's no one inside of it. There's no obvious damage to the car. And then the hunter began kind of scanning around the area to see if there was some obvious reason someone would stop right at that particular spot. But when he looked around, all he saw was thick trees on either side and the mountain kind of sloped down on either side. And so there was nothing unique about the spot. And so something just kind of struck the hunter as odd about this car. It just seemed totally out of place. And so operating on a hunch, the hunter would leave the mountain range and head into Danavirk, and he would contact police and he would tell them about this car and where it was located. Because in the hunter's mind, you know, maybe someone had been reported missing in the area and maybe this car is connected. And so after yeah, hearing yeah. about the car, the police Sorry. did not know of any missing person cases that were connected to a car that matched the description the hunter had given. But just to be safe, the police hopped in their vehicles mm -hmm. and they drove up into the Ruahine mountain range and they went to the spot the hunter described. And sure enough, off to the side of the road is this parked car and it's still unoccupied. Mm -hmm. After inspecting the vehicle, the police came to the same conclusion the hunter did, that there was no obvious signs of damage to the car that might have forced someone to abandon it. And then when they looked in the window at the gas gauge, they saw the gauge was full. And so the police kind of wandered around the area, kind of doing an initial search to see if maybe the owner of this car would... I mean, I mean, that's, it's like, uh, that's, I mean, luck, good lucky and or car specific because, you know, my car doesn't, I think, I don't know how many cars stay at how full the car is when the car's off. Mine, you know, goes down and when you turn it on, it shoots to whatever the fuck foliage it is. So that's interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe cars in New Zealand work differently. I don't know. Fascinating was nearby but you know there was no one there they're in this very isolated part of this wilderness area and so the police just took down the license plate of the car and they went back to their station and when they got there they ran the license plate number and it turned out the car belonged to jason chase when jason's family was contacted about you know why is jason's car up in the ruahine mountains you know where's jason his family was pretty surprised. They explained to police that Jason had made plans to come visit them around Christmas time, and so they were expecting him to come this way. And you know, the Ruahin mountain range, it is only eight miles away from Danaburk, so you know, in theory, maybe he stopped there on the way to their house, but they told police that just didn't make any sense. So as a precaution, the police decided to launch a search for Jason. Yeah. And unfortunately, despite hundreds of people on the ground searching the Ruahin mountain range, and helicopters overhead flying all over the place, no trace of Jason was found. And so the official search was called off right before Christmas, but Jason's family and friends, they continued to look for him. And on January 3rd, they would find him. One of the family friends who had agreed to continue looking for Jason after the official search had shut down was a farmer who owned a plane. And on January 3rd, as he did one of his passes over the foothills of the Ruahin mountain range, he looked down and he saw this bright red thing that looked totally out of place. And the pilot couldn't tell what it was. And so he took note of its location. And then when he landed, he passed those coordinates off to the ground team. And so the ground team, they made their way over to this location, which was quite far away from where Jason's car had been. And after making their way through some very thick brush in some very steep sections, they eventually walked out to this big open clearing. It was a dry riverbed, and right in front of them, in the middle of it, was the bright red thing. It was Jason's shirt, and Jason was still wearing it. He was found lying on his left side with his legs stretched out. He had on his bright red rugby t-shirt, some khaki shorts on, and he had no shoes or socks on. According to the searchers who first saw Jason in this dry creek bed, they would say the scene was very peaceful and it almost looked like Jason had lied down to fall asleep but Jason was not sleeping, he was dead. Jason had no visible injuries and there was no sign of a struggle in the area. 
In fact, it didn't even look like Jason had been in the wild for very long because his clothes were pristine and despite being barefoot, his feet were in great condition. Despite a lengthy search around the area where his body was discovered, his shoes and socks would not be recovered. The only thing they found in the area was a water bottle that belonged to Jason. Adding to the mystery of what happened to Jason were the results of his autopsy. The pathologist was unable to find any injuries. Jason also seemed well nourished because- I mean, dude does bike racing and shit. I assume like actual biking, like not like, motorcycle or anything like that. So the dude's probably fucking fit as fuck. So that's odd. He had food in his stomach and he was hydrated because there was urine in his bladder. His toxicology report also came back negative for all drugs, medications, and a range of common poisons. The only odd thing the pathologist found during the autopsy was that Jason had two very small ulcers in his duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. According to this pathologist, these type of ulcers only appear from acute stress moments before death. However, these ulcers don't indicate what caused the stress. Right. Typically, things like severe injury or septicemia, which is blood poisoning, will cause these stress ulcers. But Jason had neither of those. So at the end of the autopsy, the pathologist concluded that Jason had not been the victim of a homicide. He had not right. committed suicide. Right. He had died from, quote, obscure natural causes. <laughs> Interestingly, obscure. though, the pathologist was able to determine with some certainty that Jason died on or around December 30th which means he was alive for the entirety of the official search for him, as well as the bulk of that private search conducted by friends and family. After so he was walking around there when they were searching for him. Don't know how they didn't find him. Um, but I don't know how searches work. It's probably really hard. But weird part... I mean, first off, why was he there? I'm sure this was never answered. Um... I don't know, was it some kind of like heart attack? Would you be able to scan for that and figure that out? Like, seems like, because like, you know, stress, if your body's going under stress or whatnot, you're probably freaking out, knowing like, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack and I'm out here in the wild, I'm gonna die. I'm sure that would cause stress. <laughs> I don't know what kind of stress it's talking about, but like, you know, that, that PA or whatnot, but I don't know, that's fascinating. After the autopsy results came out, Jason's case was closed, and his family, despite having lots of unanswered questions, was forced to just move on. Fifteen years later, the same pathologist that had conducted Jason's autopsy was talking to a colleague about Jason's case, and as he was describing where Jason was found, the colleague suddenly stopped the pathologist and said, wait a minute, I think I know what happened to him. And it would turn out he did. The following oh, is shit. a reconstruction of what happened to Jason Chase. On December 13th, 2002, Jason left his home in Gisborne and began heading south towards Danavirk where his family lived. Right. But before he got to his family's home, he took a detour up into the Ruahine mountain range where he eventually parked his car on the side of the road. Once his car was stopped, he got out and collected his backpack and sleeping bag. Those were two items that were never discovered during the search or after his body was found, but it was later determined they were missing from his vehicle. Okay. And so after he has his pack and his sleeping bag, he also grabs- so this was intentional. Grabs a water bottle, and then he leaves the main road and begins walking into the woods, making his way down the mountain. He eventually would find a spot- Well, father, Jason would have been in. Huh on the side of the mountain that he liked and so he set up a campsite. What happens next is very confusing because we don't actually know why Jason actually went camping in the first place or when he intended to leave, but we can make one assumption. Whatever he was doing in the mountains, he planned on wrapping it up in time to still get to his family's house in Danavirk on or before Christmas Day. Right. Um... Doesn't, you know, it seems like a fitness kind of person. Maybe it's just like, you know, it's going to get dark soon. I don't want to drive in the night. It didn't seem like it was that far 
way, but maybe it was. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. So he's just like, you know, I'll just go out in this woods a little bit. I'm a rugged dude or something. And I'll just, I'll just camp or something like that. But then what would have happened after that? It's fucking bizarre, man. So weird when you have like these unanswered questions of, like, why did you go out in the fucking woods? It's, it's fascinating. December 25th. So from December 13th, when he first got out of his car and entered the wilderness until December 25th, it's believed Jason was by choice out in the wilderness of the Ruahine mountain range. And so as this huge huh. search is launched for him in the area he is in, it's entirely possible that he either did not see any of the searchers. This is a very rugged and heavily forested area. And so that's not totally outlandish. Right. Or two, even if he did see the searchers, he may not have recognized that they, they were, were looking, looking for him. For because remember someone. during that time frame. He didn't think he was in danger. He was out in the wilderness. He wasn't missing. He knew where he was. He knew what he was doing. So even if you saw people like, oh, I wonder who they're searching for. I feel like if you're ever out in the middle of the woods at a certain location, whatnot, and you're ever wondering uh, if you ever, like, because I've heard there was like stories of someone who like joined part of their own search, not realizing that people were searching for them. Um, I don't remember if that was a story in here. Here? Oh no! I think there's a. I think that was a story I watched off camera. I don't know if it was one of Mr. Baldwin's or whatnot, but uh, or if I heard it from somewhere. But like, if you're ever like, to see people, they're just like, oh, they seem to be searching for something, and not just like, oh, you know, just some random stranger just walking around. You should probably go and be like, hey, who are you searching for? What are you searching for? What are we uh, what we got this group scanning for? You know, because it's like I'm out here, on the off chance that someone filed a missing persons report for me specifically maybe i should go make sure yeah i feel like anyone should just have that mindset of just like if i ever see a bunch of people they look like they're searching for something maybe i should you know and they don't look like they're searching for me or any human being to do something crazy to you know if it actually looks like a search and rescue team i should be like hey who are you looking for it's not me is it okay cool <laughs> but then it might be like but why are you out here, though? Like, it's like, no reason. I was camping. <laughs> don't, don't worry about me, uh, you, uh, as you were. This <laughs> camping by choice. But sometime around December 25th, or maybe a couple of days before, when he needed to leave and go back to Danavirk to see his family, after packing up his stuff, for whatever reason, he could not get back up to the road where his car was. Either there was some sort of physical boundary, or maybe he got lost. But either way, instead of going back up the mountain, we know Jason actually turned and began going down the mountain, away from the road and away from his car. It's believed Jason actually just decided he would hike his way out of the mountains. He was in great shape, very healthy guy, and he probably figured he could just hike the eight miles to Danavirk, and then he could have someone drive him back up and retrieve his car at a later date. But on- I don't know what it's like in New Zealand. But you don't, like, just leave. In, in the U.S., at least, you don't just leave a car in the middle of nowhere. Because um, it'd be like, I'll come back for it in a couple of days. That car probably won't be there. <laughs> There's a good chance it won't be there. If it is there, there could be any number of who the fuck knows what living in there. Or someone who's been watching it, waiting for someone to come back, and that's the moment they're going to take you. Or that, that car is gutted for parts, man. That car is no longer <laughs> no longer in a drivable condition. Uh, so, like, I don't know how it is in New Zealand. Apparently, you guys are a lot more trusting. But uh, in the U.S., you, you don't just leave your car for an extended period of time, or like days or whatever, and just off the side of the road. Also, if anyone, any police or whatever happens to come by and see it, probably tow it so like you know what I mean so like you just don't do that so it's uh, cultural differences here it's very interesting or around December 30th 
Jason was still out in the mountains. And at this point, he had abandoned his backpack and his sleeping bag and had most likely removed his shoes and socks for reasons we don't know. But he had managed to get much closer to Danavirk. He just had to navigate a few more steep sections and then he'd be home free. And so on or around December 30th, Jason began slowly making his way down the mountainside until he reached a decision point. He found himself standing at the top of two very steep gullies that both would bring him down to a dry stretch of riverbed. And so either Scotland. option worked. It just became a matter of which one is Those safer. Close to each and so other. after making his assessment about which gully he should take, he made his choice and he made his way down and he reached the dry riverbed. And it was at this point that Jason would have begun to feel a pain in his stomach. And that pain would have gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where Jason likely sat down on this dry riverbed, kind of waiting for the pain to subside, but it wouldn't, it would only intensify. And so as he's sitting there kind of wondering what's going on, his vision would begin to blur and then he would start to struggle breathing. And before he could deal with all of these strange symptoms that were coming on really suddenly, he lost the ability to move his body and he slumped over onto his left side and there he would lay until he died. It would turn out the gully that Jason had chosen to go down when he was standing at the top and he had those two choices. The one he chose, that one contained a plant called Urtica ferrix. This plant, which is no endemic way. to New Zealand, grows leaves that are covered in little rigid stinging hairs that contain a toxin called trifidin. And trifidin in high enough doses not only causes stomach pain and blurred vision and trouble breathing, but it also causes total body paralysis and even death. Jason, who according to friends, would have known about the dangers this plant posed, likely just didn't see the cluster of plants when he was assessing which gully to go down. And so it wasn't until he was partway down the gully and was in these plants that he realized his mistake. But when he turned to go back up, it was just too steep. And so he was forced to trudge through these toxic plants. And because he was wearing shorts, his lower legs were exposed and they were stung repeatedly. And so he was dealt a lethal dose. The reason the pathologist was not able to identify this as Jason's cause of death is because the stingers on those plants, they don't leave any marks on the human body. And it's poison, trifidin, is so rare that when they sent out that toxicology report, they didn't include it. They did not test for trifidin. And so it wasn't until 15 years later when the pathologist's colleague heard that Jason had been found in the Ruahine Mountains that the colleague said, wait a minute, have you checked for trifidin? Because he knew the Ruahine Mountains were home to clusters of that toxic plant. And so sure enough, they went back to where Jason's body had been found and lining the gully that he had come down were dozens and dozens of those plants. Dude got done in by bushes. <laughs> That's so unfortunate, man. Like, that's just, you know, it's just, I mean, obviously you're probably fine if you don't just go, decide to go off into the fucking wilderness, but, like, it's just, you know, like, living in other places seems like a fucking nightmare. Like, I don't, I mean, we got, like, poison ivy and shit, but, like, that's just gonna make you itchy and rashy and shit. It's probably not gonna fucking kill you. Like, there's, play, there's other fucking nations that, like, if you touch a plant, you're dead. <laughs> there's places like Australia where they have like spiders this big just fucking chilling in your house and shit and you're like oh that's normal but like like it's just like well, I, I don't know why if I would live in any other fucking location they just got killer plants that you could accidentally just I'm dead dog dog I mean I'm sure we have stuff like that in the US I mean the first thing that came to mind was like Florida we get, you got fucking alligators that can be in your back fucking yard so that's like uh, I, honestly, I would rather wrestle a fucking alligator all day, every day, than have a giant fucking spider just chilling in my house. Anywhere near my fucking house. Like, I'd, I'd take an alligator, I'd punch a fucking alligator, I'd go down punching an alligator in the face and not be as scared as I would if a giant fucking spider was bursting through my room. Fuck that shit. <laughs> I'd, the spider wouldn't have to do anything, I'd kill myself. <laughs> like, fuck that shit. I'll take an alligator any goddamn day. I am never going to Australia, dude. I'm never going to any place that has giant fucking spiders. <laughs> Fuck.
Fuck that noise. I don't like the spiders we have around the U.S. already. I ain't going fuck that. Anyways, let's, I think the story's over, but let's let it keep going. So, that's going to do it. Yeah. If you got something out of... God damn, man. God damn. Done in by a plant, dude. That's the worst. And it was a fitty fitty. If he would have chosen the other one, probably would have made it. I still don't know why he decided to abandon his shit. Like, did he like did abandon it before then? So he's just like, ah, I'm close anyways. Fuck, I don't need this stuff. So just throw it. That doesn't really make any sense. That's also kind of an unanswered mystery. Maybe he was like, oh, these plants are going to kill me. Well, don't need this anymore, you know what I mean? I can't get back up. Ah, that's unfortunate. I would have tried. I would. I would. When you can see, like, oh, I know these plants are gonna kill me. <laughs> Don't just go trudge through. Like, you gotta try at least to climb around them, right? That's unfortunate, dog. That's fucking unfortunate. <sighs> Speaking of unfortunate, a series of unfortunate events here. All three of them dead. I thought the second one was gonna survive, and then he killed himself. Fucking a. So. First one's just super unfortunate, but also a great harrowing tale as why you don't drink. Or at least if you're going to get so fucked up, you can do it with backup. Do it with someone who's going to be watching you or not. I'm a designated uh, driver, but also a designated sober person for life because I don't drink alcohol. So like I'm everyone's designated driver, <laughs> which I don't mind. Actually, as I've said before, there's a lot of perks to being a designated driver. People will just give you free food and shit if you'll drive them around when they're drunk. It's great. <laughs> like, I fucking, last time I was driving my brother around uh, on his birthday because he knew him and his buddy were going to get a little fucked up and we were hanging out playing games, uh, like arcades and stuff, and uh, just all food, all drinks, anything I want on them. Like, fucking dude, I, I was on fire, baby. I was on fire. It was a great day. Uh, but, um, yeah, so that one's just unfortunate, but honestly, just don't get drunk. Uh, second one, um, dumb motherfucker. I mean, first off, he wasn't, you know, he want he, he dude wanted to see some titties and some some hanging dong. He wanted to see, he wanted to see some people hanging brain and some some titties, you know, and whatnot. It's just like, okay, I get it. You know, it's easier ways to do that on the internet, but I don't know what year it was. Um, but hey, he wanted in person. I know it wasn't good enough. He wanted to see them, them, them swinging. I, I feel like there's other places you can go than death itself to see some swinging genitalia, but like, teach their fucking own. Um, hot springs does sound nice though. Hot springs does sound nice. It does sound pretty awesome. But why, I, I don't know why you would want hot springs in a super hot location. That just seems like a way to die, <laughs> like, from heat stroke and shit, but. Maybe maybe wait until like till the middle of the night where there's much less heat and the sun's down and stuff. I, that makes sense. That that'd be nice, relaxing night party, and then you you have an orgy with the with the, the the nudist colony. Yeah, logical. I get it. That sounds like an appealing vacation and whatnot. But when you escape death the first time, don't be like, well, let's roll the dice again. Hey, this time no water. Come at me, death. Well, guess what? Death came at you. You dumb motherfucker. Uh, the third one there just, I don't know, dude's like, you know what, I'm trained, I'm in training for this biking and stuff, that means I can walk through the fucking wilderness and hike eight miles in dense jungle, well not jungle, but dense forest land, and hills and rocks and stuff, no problem, I got this, like, a little crazy, but sure, fine, you know, whatever. I, I will never understand those who are just like, I don't want to go camping in the untamed wilderness. After these stories, I will never understand people with that mindset. But like, hey, just because I want to do it doesn't mean, I don't know, if, uh, maybe it's still crazy, but it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Just, I won't fucking do it. Uh, so yeah, those were interesting stories. Um, very fascinating stories here. I, I, I enjoyed those. Um, I'm glad I wasn't just 40 minutes on purely... Uh, secret room and place in college campus and whatnot but pretty much it was, it was similar but different um because it was a machine like room and whatnot but it was for fallout purposes and similar to my story um and you can't really get trapped or locked in there potentially 
but they actually do keep it locked so there's that they had to get someone to open it for us so you know negligence it's a thing um yeah very fascinating well it's three o'clock in the a.m i think i'm gonna go to sleep i enjoyed the story i hope you enjoyed it too i hope you enjoyed the reaction and i will see you all next time